God, when I, in awesome wonder, consider all the world thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Father, I need you more than anything. And I need you because you're good. I need you because you're bigger than me. I need you because you're greater than me. I need you because you're greater than anything that's going on in any area of this life, in this world. We need you more than anything. And so, God, we want to take a moment just to sit you high. Just to lift you up. High above our circumstances, high above our worlds, high above our lives, high above everything. You are God, creator of the universe. You speak and things happen. You will and lives change. So God, we proclaim how great you are today. I shouldn't even be here. But by the grace of God, we are all in this room together. So, God, we position ourselves right now to hear from you. What you have to say today is real, but it's not easy. I know that. You know that. Prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us today and help us to trust you with our lives, with this word, and give us a heart willing to respond to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all. I needed a moment. Um, hey! Hi. So good to be here. It's so good to see you all. Um, like Marcus said, I um, am no stranger to the Factory Church, but I could be a stranger to some of you. Um, but this is home for me. It always has been. Um, I met PK several years ago. We were both kind of mentoring in the same uh, program called Teach One to Lead One, mentoring at-risk kids. And I was at an event, and he spoke at it, and, and I sang at it. And so we kind of he kind of came up to me, and I was looking for a church, not really, but kind of. I had kind of left my last church and was really chilling. I was good not having a church home. I was just kind of floating around, and I was doing my thing. But he was like, hey, I want to tell you about this church I'm planting. I'm just like, uh, you don't really look like a dude I would want to go to church with. Um, you know, your dreads are too long. Like, you, where, where'd you, where do you come from? Like, it's just all those types of things. Um, but he was like, yeah, I want to just tell you about it. And so I was like, all right. And so I met him at, um, at Chick-fil-A off Barrett Parkway, and I met he, and I met Lucille, and then Shelly was there. And I was like, what's this white lady doing here? Um, <laughs> Because in my mind, you know, you see black pastor, you think black church, you know, it's just, that's just how that, how that went. But God had something else in store, and he quickly started telling me the vision that God placed on his heart 
about the factory church, about a church designed to make disciples the other six days, and my heart leaped. It was exactly what God had for me. It was exactly what I knew I had been having conversations with God about. And so he planted me here, and I was here for six years and loved every minute of it. Um, and PK always would tell me, he was like, you ain't going to be here long. I'm like, why would you say that? Don't be saying stuff like that. This is my church. You're trying to kick me out. And he was just like, I don't know. It's just, it's, I just feel like it. And uh, sure enough, God called me to a different season of ministry in a different space, but this is still home. And one of the things that I love about the Lord is that the body of Christ is huge. And so no matter where you serve, no matter where you attend on a Sunday, you're still a part of one body. And that is the body of Christ. And so I'm so grateful that he still trusts me to be here, uh, even in his absence. And I'm so grateful for him and, and I'm excited to be sharing with you guys today. And one of my favorite phrases that I'll share with you that PK says all the time is, I won't be before you long. But uh, truthfully, I'm really going to try not to do that. Um, but I do want to uh, dive into this text today. And, and the reason why I, 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 I was sitting over there and I didn't, I didn't sing at the top of the last message, but I needed to really remind myself in the moment of how big God is. Because what he has for me to share with you today may be very uncomfortable for you. It's not necessarily that, you know, rah-rah type of a message. It's something that might convict you. There's just nothing wrong with conviction. Condemnation is a totally different thing. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but conviction is a good thing because it causes us to wrestle with what God is trying to share with us and encourages us to grow if we so desire to do so. And so that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. You guys have been in this series called Fellowship Part 2, and today is week three. First week, you heard from Marcus. He kind of introduced the series to you, and you talked about the call, and he said, who you with? You know, and he told us, and he reminded us, if you have accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have an assignment. And so that assignment is true for everyone. If you say Jesus is my Lord, then you have an assignment. And he told us that the harvest was plentiful, plentiful but the laborers were few. And so there's an assignment that we all have. And then last week, Murray Tillis came in and he shared about the commissioning, that God commissioned the 12. He called them by name and he said for them to go. He gave them an assignment to a specific group of people. He told them to go to the lost sheep of Israel. So there is a group of people that we have been called to. I may not meet, reach the masses, but if you're standing in front of me, I get to reach you today, Lord willing. And so we all have an assignment for a group of people. And he said, when you go, go to those who will listen. And then he also said, if they don't listen, peace out. It's really okay. You can leave the ones who don't. And so that gives us some liberty and some freedom that we don't have to, we don't have to make people follow Jesus. We extend invitations with the truth of the gospel. People can either accept or they can decline. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting him. And so our job is to go. And so this week, what we want to talk about is diving into the next part of Matthew chapter 10, which is talking about the cost of fellowship. And that's not an easy thing. There is a cost to everything. And so we cannot deny that even though we are followers of Jesus and we, we, we go where he tells us to go, there is a cost to it. And sometimes we want to pay that cost and sometimes we don't. And you know, one of my uh, favorite things that I think about sometimes, or one of my favorite um, devices, if you will, on my phone is my GPS system. I like my GPS. Sometimes I wonder, what did we do before those things popped up? Like, I mean, yeah, we were, we, we were lost. She said, we'd we be lost. And you would. You'd kind of be pulling over, turning on your light and your dash, and kind of looking at a map and pulling out stuff from the glove box. I remember that. It's hard to actually have to recall what it was like to be in a car and not know where you were really going. And it was one of those things where I remember, you know, my dad would pull a map out. Sometimes we pull the map out ahead of time before the trip started. You pull the map out. You say, you know, this is where I am. This is where I'm going. You're going to take highway such and such. You're going to take interstate this, and you're going to get off. And then most times you would have to write it down because you, wouldn't, you didn't want to forget or you had to pull your map out if you got lost. And so that sounds rather antiquated and hard for some of us younger people, us younger people, to remember <laughs> But it was a, it's a real thing. But now we have these GPS systems that gives us so much convenience, and it tells us exactly where we want to go. And everyone has their favorite system. For some of you, it's Waze. You like Waze. 
Waze is the most aggravating GPS system in the world to me because it doesn't stay the same. Like you start me in one direction and then you figure out, oh, there might be a better route. So then you take me down ABC road and then all of a sudden you're taking me back to where I started because you, I mean, it's just so, uh, it's annoying. But some of y'all love Waze. Some of you like Google Maps, bless your hearts. Some of you like Google Maps. I am an Apple Maps person. It's all right. God still loves you anyway. I'm an Apple Maps person, and my favorite feature about my GPS system is that I get options when I get there. It gives me literally two to three options. It'll tell me what the fastest route out route is. It'll tell me what the shortest route is, and it'll tell me, give me multiple options, and so I get to decide. I also get to have other options that I can kind of push a button and say, hey, I want to avoid the highways, or I want to avoid tolls, and so it will shift the route based on my preferences. It changes the route based on how I want to get to my destination. But our natural tendency is to want to go the way we want. We want the path of least resistance. We want the easy route, right? We want to get there fast and quick without any inconveniences. We don't like to look on that GPS system and see all those red marks where all the traffic is. Y'all heard I work in Buckhead. So I pull up GPS every morning. And I look and I want to see which is going to be the quickest route. If I see all these red dots, I don't want to go that way. But we get those conveniences because of this GPS system. And what what if, what if though, there was only one option? What if there was only one way? How you feel about that, really? I mean, think about that for a second. What if there was only one option? Is the destination worth the cost of the journey? Is where you're headed worth the cost of the journey? In other words, is it worth it? Is it worth it to you? If you told your friend down in Florida, hey, you got this event going on, I'm going to be there. I promise you I'm going to be there. And so I pull up my GPS system. And all the routes that I would normally take, the quickest route that I know straight down I-75 is shut down because they're doing some construction. And it's taking you all of these other routes. And there's no other path but this one route. And instead of it taking you six hours to get there, it's going to take you 12 hours to get there. Is it worth it to you? And in fact, on that same trip, you promised your kids that you would take them to Disney World. So they're in the car and they're ready to go and you pull up the GPS 12 hours and they're like, come on, mom, I got my ears on, I'm ready to go. And then you get there and normally you would buy that ticket that would make you bypass the line where it's not an hour and a half wait. Now it's only 15 minutes if I have this, but this particular day. They don't have any passes available. Everybody has to wait, and the waits are running an hour and a half to two hours. Is it worth it to you? Is it worth the trip? You're trying to advance at your job, and you go to your director or your boss or your supervisor, and you say, hey, this is a goal I'm trying to reach. I'm trying to make more money. I'm trying to to get ahead in my career. And they're like, absolutely, this is great. The way to this is this three-year program, but in order to be a part of this program, you're going to have to quit your current job, take a pay cut, and dive into this job for three years. Is it worth it to you? Or you want to get married, you got a new boo, and y'all together. And it's time to tie the knot. And you go to your pastor, you go to your minister, and you say, hey, we want to get married. And we want to take, we heard there was this pre, premarital counseling thing. And so, yeah, we want to get that done so we can go ahead and get married. And we're like, absolutely, that is wonderful. We have a program here that's six months long. And if you all want to get married, you're going to have to go through this program for six months. And you have to be at every session, and it's about two hours every week for six months. Is it worth it to you? Or you go to the doctor. And they tell you, you've got diabetes. And they say, hey, this is reversible. All you got to do, cut the carbs, cut the sugar, start exercising more, and you can be out of here. We can take this diagnosis away from you. But you love your sugar. You love your mac and cheese. You love all your sweet things. Is it worth it to you? Is it worth it to you? There's a cost associated with everything. And the cost is determined by the value you place on what you desire. The cost is already, it's already determined by how much you really want what you want. 
and the disciples were in the same space. They had met this man named Jesus. All of their lives, they had heard that there was a Messiah coming. There is a Messiah coming who will save us from this life that we're living, who will be a king, the greatest of all kings, and he will deliver us from this present situation. And they heard about this man named Jesus, and they saw him doing miracle after miracle. He was raising people from the dead and healing people and saving and transforming lives, and they saw him, and he got an invitation and he said to them, hey, come follow me. And they were like, yes, I think this is the man. I want to do this. I want to follow Jesus. I want to believe in this Messiah. I want to be a part of this new kingdom that he's talking about. So they signed up. When Jesus said, follow me, they said, yes, I'm right here. They left their fishermen's tents and they left that tax booth and they went and they followed Jesus. And as you heard over the last couple of weeks now, Jesus is sitting down with them and they're being shipped out. He says, I'm going to send you out. But he had some instructions for them. And like any good teacher, he gave them an instructions and he told them, he said, hey, when you go, don't take anything with you. Don't take any money. Don't take any clothes. Let the people who are out there care for you. If they're good people, stay with them. Give them your blessing. If they shun you, peace out. Kick the dust off your feet and keep it moving. He told them, go to the people that you know. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. Don't go any further. He gave them very specific instructions. And they're like, yeah, I bet. I'm in. I'm going. I'm, oh, this is so exciting. And he told them, he said, you have been given all power and authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to raise the dead. And they're just like, "Woo! I got it. I'm here. I am in. You have called me. I am on. Come on, Jesus. Let's do this. They're ready. He's got the little black marks under their eyes. They're ready. To <laughs> put me in, boss. Put me in. Put me in, coach. But then he was like, hey, 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 slow your roll. There's something else I need to tell you. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. He says this. He says, look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. He said, look, this means pay attention to what I am about to say to you. I know you're excited. I know somebody told you that you won't go to hell if you follow me, but hey, there's a cost to this. Pay attention to what I'm about to share with you because this is very important. It's the first word he used. Some translations say, behold. He says, look, this is important. He says, be shrewd as snakes. Shrewd means thoughtful and discerning. Don't go in there all amped and excited and lose your mind. Don't go in there slipping. Don't go in there without caution. He said, be wise, be smart about what you're doing. This is not some willy-nilly assignment. This is very strategic what I'm sending you out to do. And he said, but be harmless as a dove. He says, be innocent, simple, be free from guile, live above reproach. It's like I need you to be wise, but I also need you to be gentle. I need you to be peaceful. Don't draw too much attention to yourself. He said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, as sheep among wolves. And every time I see that, I see this picture of other sheep. They all look like me, but one of them's a wolf. They all look like me. We got the same fur on, but one of them's a wolf. It's like Little Red Riding Hood. Gee, Grandma, what big teeth you have. She looks like your grandma, but deep down, she's a wolf. Jesus says, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. That means there is danger. And he's drawing their attention to that. He goes on in verse 17. He says, be aware, beware, for you will be handed over to the courts and will be flogged with whips in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and other unbelievers about me. He says, beware. Be aware. I want you to know something. Hey, listen to me. They're going to flog you. Your own people. Remember, he's still with the lost sheep of Israel. These are his cousins, their cousins and their uncles and their relatives and the people they grew up with and the people they went to synagogue with. They're going to beat you. And where will they beat you? In your own church. In the place where you thought would be safe. In the place where you thought we all lift our hands together and worship the same God. We're all crying out, waiting for the same Messiah. Yes, those same people will beat you and destroy you. You're going to be arrested and taken before the legal council. You're going to be taken to court. 
by the people who you said were family. They're going to turn you over to be flogged and whipped and beaten. And I can imagine they're sitting there thinking, wait a minute. I, I, I just wanted to sign up to follow you. They're going to whip me? They're going to beat me, my own family, my own kinfolk, my own church family? They're going to talk about me? They're going to turn me over to be arrested? I have to go through all of this to tell people about you? And in that, that's the reason it says, but this will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and other unbelievers about me. So wait a minute, I got to go through all that just to tell them about you? Is that what this requires? And hear me, at this point, Jesus hadn't been beaten yet. Jesus hadn't been flogged yet. Jesus hadn't been taken over by the Sanhedrin yet. None of that had happened. He's asking them to do something that he hadn't quite stepped into yet. But he's giving them a heads up. This is what you're going to have to do. You ask yourself the question, man, is it worth it? And then in verse 19, he says, and when you are arrested, because you will be arrested, Don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it is not you who will be speaking. It will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. Wait a minute. This is a lot, Jesus. Just imagine yourself as the 12. Sitting there, hearing Jesus. You were all amped up and ready to go. And now he's throwing all of this at you. This is a lot. They're going to beat me. I'm going to be arrested. And they're going to take me in front of these people, but, but now i got to speak? There's a speaking part to this? I'm not a speaker. I don't do that. I, I, I don't want to talk about you. Can I just live my life right and let people guess that I'm a Christian? Can I just post the post and let people realize that I posted a scripture today? Isn't that enough for people to really know that I follow Jesus? i got to speak? Yeah, <laughs> you do. How will they know unless you tell them? Jesus is telling them speaking is a part of the deal. That's a part of the cost. you got to open up your mouth. And opening up your mouth will expose what's on the inside of it. But he says, don't worry about what you say. He says, the Spirit will give you the right words at the right time. It wasn't magic words, though. They're not magic words. And when I read this, I was like, okay, the word I saw twice in that sentence was right. The right word at the right time. But the word had to already be there. The word had to already be there. Words known are the words used. If there's no word in you, he can't bring it out of you. If you hadn't taken time to study and spend time with the Lord and know what the word says, if they didn't know what the Bible had said, if they didn't know what their their scripture said, they had nothing to draw from. David said, thy word have I hidden in my heart. It's got to be there to be used. If I go to take a Spanish test and I've been in Spanish class, I can't pass this test if I hadn't studied Spanish. I used to do that all the time. As a kid, I'd be like, oh, I got a test tomorrow. I knew I hadn't studied. And I'd be like, Jesus, Lord, I haven't studied for this test, Lord, but, but could you please just give me the answers, Lord? I can't fail this test. My dad said I can't go to that party if I don't, if I don't pass this test. Come on, come on, on. And I fail. I fail. Why? Because it wasn't in there. I didn't take the time to prepare. God, Jesus told them that the Spirit would give you the right word at the right time. But the word's got to be there. It's a part of it. it it's got to be there to be used. So invest in scripture reading. Wait a minute. You're asking too much. I just want to follow him. I don't really need to read this book, do I? I could just go to church on Sunday and let somebody come up and read the scripture for me. That should be enough. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Then Jesus goes on. He's still giving his instruction. He takes it to another level, actually, in verse 21. He says, a brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child, and children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. And all nations will hate you because you are my followers. But everyone who endures to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted, when you are persecuted, in one town flee to the next. 
I tell you the truth, the Son of Man will return before you have reached all of the towns of Israel. Family members will betray me? My family? They'll have me killed? They'll turn me in? I'm going to have to go to one town and they're going to be chasing me? I'm going to be fleeing from one town to the next town? Living like, a, a, like, like somebody who's on the run because of you? Because I want to follow you? I'm going to be hated because of you? I'm going to lose friends and jobs and opportunities because of you? I'll lose my Facebook followers, my IG followers, my TikTok followers because of you? My reputation will come into question because of you? My good name. Come on, it's my good, it's my name. My word is my bond. Come on. Because of you? That's being risked. And my question to you, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And then in verses 24 and 25, Jesus reminds them. He says, hey, hey, just so you know, students are not greater than their teacher and slaves are not greater than their master. Students are to be like their teacher, and slaves are to be like their master. And since I, the master of the household, have been called the prince of demons, the members of my household will be called even worse names. I can imagine these disciples. Put yourself in their shoes for a second. Be in the room where it's happening. Jesus is talking to you. You were all in Five minutes ago, you were ready. Put me in, coach. And now he's told you what it's going to require of you. And I can imagine them looking at each other and asking themselves the question, is it worth it? Is following Jesus worth all this? And he says, he says, students aren't above their master. The thing I love about learning about rabbis and teachers and students, apprentices are disciples. Disciples are an apprentice. You are learning from the one that you are following. And what I've learned about that is that in this day and time, when an apprentice was following his master, he walked so closely behind that master that the dust from his feet saturated that disciple by the end of the day. He walked so closely that he got dusty. He walked so closely behind him that everywhere that master went, he went too. He wanted to see. He wanted to learn everything that this master was seeing and learning and experiencing. He wanted to be so close behind him that he got dusty. But now that I know what it's going to cost me, I don't don't think, I, I don't know if I want this. And we probably have all asked ourselves that same question over and over again when stuff gets hard. Is, is it worth it? I got to love unconditionally. Is it worth it? I got to turn the other cheek again. I ain't got but two. Is it worth it? I got to forgive them again and again and again and again and again and again. You did it again and I got to forgive you. Is it worth it? I got to be nice to you when you're not nice to me. You actually mistreat me. Is it worth it? It's a serious question. And it's one that Jesus took seriously because he paused in his commissioning, in his sending them out. He stopped long enough to make sure they understood what it was going to cost them. That's love. Why would I send my child out in the street and I hadn't taught them how to drive yet? Why would I give them the keys to the car and I know they don't know how to drive? Why wouldn't I tell them that the other people around you, they didn't learn from me, so they don't drive as well? They will hit you and tell you it's your fault. I wouldn't do that because I love my children. And God loves us. 
And he wants us to know what this is going to cost us. And we live in a real cushy world right now. We live and we do what we want to do. We experience what we want to experience. But in other places that are not called the United States of America, in, in Woodstock, Georgia, it ain't so easy. And we would be very arrogant to think that it ain't coming our way. It may not come the same way, but it's coming. In fact, for many of us, it's already here. We are facing these challenges consistently. But in the midst of all of this, Jesus presents two areas of hope in this text that I don't want us to miss. And the first one is in verse 22. Jesus said something really specific. He said, but everyone who endures to the end will be saved. That's hope right there. Everyone who endures to the end will be saved. To endure is to persevere under misfortune and trials, to hold fast to one's faith in Jesus Christ. If you just keep holding on and you keep going, those that endure to the end will be saved. And he doesn't mean saved from your current suffering. He doesn't mean that your situation may change in the moment. But you will be saved and preserved and rescued from the evils and the thoughts that obstruct your belief that the Messiah will deliver. He will keep you from believing the lie that says he's not worth it. He will save you from yourself. From your own thoughts. From the thoughts that are swirling around you where people say he ain't worth all that. He didn't even write that book. Man wrote that book. Who else was supposed to write it? I digress. Y'all totally missed that one. In other words, you will be rescued from the lies of the enemy, which are continually on assignment to convince you that he is not worth it. And the second presentation of hope is in verse 23. He says, I tell you the truth. I love this one. The son of man will return before you have reached all the towns of Israel. Now understand, this is not talking about the second coming. Jesus was giving them a specific assignment for that time. He was sending them out to to towns that they were all around. He gave them specific places to go. And in that, he told them, hey, he says, the son of man will return before you have reached all those towns. In other words, I'm coming right behind you. I know I'm sending you out, but I'm coming right behind you. In other words, I got your back. If you will just endure, if you will just keep going, if you will just keep pressing your way, I'm coming right behind you. I am not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I have got your back. I've got you covered. I know what I'm sending you into, and I've got your back. I will protect you. It is a promise. And so what I want us to leave here today with, like I said, it may not make you too excited. And fortunately, you get to continue reading verse 25 and forward next week, so don't miss it. Because it doesn't stop there. But I want to end it here with the cost. I want us to leave here today pondering what it costs to follow Jesus and asking ourselves the question, is it worth it to me? Is it worth it to me to actually tell people that I follow Jesus? Is it worth it to me to actually say, no, I believe this to be true and let me tell you why? Is it worth it to me to actually get up every day and spend some time actually reading the scriptures and learning the truth? Because there's so many lies around And you can't just depend on a Sunday morning service and a message for you to get filled. Who eats once a week? Who does that? Who lives and survives and sustains and endures on one meal a week? It doesn't work that way. It's daily bread that we need to sustain us. And we have to consider the cost and ask ourselves, is it worth it? But I tell you what, the cost is great, but he is worth it. He is worth it. In fact, he thought you were worth it. He thought 
I was worth it, and he determined that you were worth it. When he looked at your life, when the creator of the universe spoke humanity into being, and when sin entered into the world and separation was made between us and God, he looked at us in our sin-sick state, and he said, oh my goodness, I cannot leave my loved ones that way. A sacrifice has to be made. Something has to die. I'll do it. I'll do it for him. I'll do it for her. I'll do it for you. He determined that you were worth it. The cost that he paid was his life. He left his throne. God is so God that he could have just created another bunch of mankind. God is so God that he could have just taken our free will and just made us robots. He could have. He is that God. He really, really is. But he wants us, he wants us to be in relationship with him because we desire to do so. And that we believe and have decided that he is worth the cost. So if you're here today and you've asked yourself that question, I, I, I just don't know if following Jesus is worth it. It's too much. Maybe I, I, I'll follow him my way. I, I'll follow him this way. I, I, I'll follow him in this area of my life, but not quite this area of my life. I'll forgive people, but I won't love them after that. I'll let him come eat with me in private. But I won't sit next to him in church or speak to him. I won't forgive him a 30th time. I won't let go. I won't keep going to counseling. I won't get outside and actually exercise. Because if I keep my body healthy, I get to do the work of the Lord longer. That's real. That's, those are facts. Those are challenges we all face. Whatever it is that God is requiring of you, is it worth it? I don't know what it is for you. You do. You know what he's been pulling at your heart about. You know what he's been drawing you closer to him in. And we dismiss it. It's not, it doesn't take all that. It takes all that and then some. And you got to ask yourself, is he worth it? Because he decided that we were. And in return, the least we could do is the little bit that he's asking us to do. He gave his life. His very life, he shed his blood so that we could have eternal life with him. Oh, y'all, he's so worth it. He really, really is, but that's your decision. And truth be told, you got to make it every day. Sometimes every second or every moment. But he's worth it. But the price we have to pay is nowhere near the price he paid. And so I want to encourage you today, endure keep going. I know it's tough. I know it's challenging. I know it's hard. But his strength is made perfect in our weakness. He can handle it and he can give us what we need to sustain us along the journey. If we trust in him, if we feed on him, if we take him in every day, we tell him what we need, he is right there. And just like he told those disciples then, I got your back. I'm coming right behind you. He is coming back again. The suffering of this present world has no comparison to what is going to be revealed. It's worth what's coming. It is so worth what's coming. I know you can't see it, but believe it. What he did was enough. His grace is sufficient. And he will carry us through. So if you're here and you don't know Jesus and you've been wrestling with that question, I want to ask you, is it worth it? I want to invite you to make a decision to say that he is worth it. And give your life to Jesus. And it's so simple. 
The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that Christ, that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. It's that simple. Confess and believe. Know your life's not going to change overnight. Confess and believe. And he has sent a helper. Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place. I have to go. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. But in exchange, he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell on the inside of us, to lead us, to guide us, to comfort us, to equip us to live this life in Christ, to pay the cost we have to pay. He does not leave us alone. He knows we can't do it on our own. But he will equip you. All you have to do is accept and receive. And for those of us who already know Jesus, yeah, sugar, I know it's hard. It's going to be hard. There will be times where it's not and you feel like you're coasting. Beware. Because it'll get hard again. Keep yourself in community with people who will encourage you. Keep yourself, keep your face in his word so that you can be strengthened for the journey every day. And continue to say and remind yourself that he is worth it. So I want to pray for us. That God would give us what we need for this journey. And for those of you who are still questioning, I get it. I want you to wrestle with it. And then next week, come back for more. Because Jesus thought it was worth it to put this in here for us to know. That's important. The Bible says no man who puts his hand toward the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. He wants us to consider the cost. He wants us to weigh it out and make an informed, intelligent decision in faith that he is worth it and what's coming is greater than what is. So, Father, this isn't easy, Lord. Sometimes the cost seems too high. It requires too much of me. I'm scared. I'm afraid. But God, you promised you'd be here with us. I don't think I can do this on my own. You promised that you would be here with us. Some of us are struggling with our own worth. How could you have paid that price for me when I don't think I'm worth it? God. Would you help us to see the value in us that you see in us? Help us see ourselves the way that you do so that we can be encouraged to recognize that the cost that we have to pay is nothing in comparison to what you paid. And I owe you my life. We owe you our lives. You did not have to give up yourself for us, but you so lovingly and graciously did. And so that, for that, God, we thank you. Father God, give us what we need to endure so that we can be rescued from the lies that would tell us that you're not worth it. Be with us, Father. Strengthen us in our inner man so that we can continue to walk this life. And as we wrestle with this question, Lord, help us to choose you every day, every second, every minute, every moment. And to not be ashamed of this gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. God, there are people dying and lost. The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Help us to be laborers that know the cost and choose to pay it. Because you are worth it all. We bless you and we honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. We're so glad that you came, encouraged that you came, and we hope you have a great rest of the week. See you next week. <laughs>